Oh, us YouTube fam, we've got a special show for you today because it's just us and it's just your questions and it's just our answers and it's going to be awesome. So hit like and subscribe and let's get after it. Yes. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Jeff Cunningham's favorite podcast in soccer we trust. I'm Jimmy Cream Cheese, Trash Can, Connor Nito Conrad, alongside Charlie Chuck Wagon Davies and Hollywood Heath Pierce. And we are doing a very special show because we are taking your questions and then we're going to answer them to the best of our ability. And I'm excited about this one. I do have a little story time first for you, Chuck and Heath and everybody listening and or watching on the YouTubes. I sent a note to Union Berlin to get Jordy Pifok on the show to talk to us. Okay. I knew they weren't going to respond right away. I knew they had a Europa League match. I know all that. Mm-hmm. But I got a response this morning and I texted it to you guys. And they said he only does interviews in French. So do I still want to continue to try to get him on the show? Well, None of us speak French. I don't know. Maybe you do, Charlie. Charlie maybe, maybe does. Yeah. Maybe. How, 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 how much French did you get in you, Charlie? Oh, yeah. Uh, about he, that. You know, he he goes, in, uh, and then it yeah. goes out. Yeah. Charlie learned to say so show. Yeah. So show. <laughs> so so so. I, I I it kind of feels like the equivalent of Heath being told that he's going to give a jersey to their grandma. Like I feel like yeah. we got big time. Just say no. Just say no. You don't want to do it. Yeah. Instead of. Oh, well, he only he making it difficult for us so that we are the ones that have to say, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Uh, you know, we- well, the, the way my bank, bank account is set up is like, you know, it's harder to, you know, you know, like that's what it feels like. The old, the old <laughs> run around. David, yeah. David Regi part two. It, it feels, <laughs> it feels like we're, there's a little obstacle in the way so that we're going to make it difficult. That's fine. That's fine. But we wanted to let everybody know that uh, we're trying to get we tried. some, some of the names out there that are. Obviously trying to push, especially to get on this roster and one that we feel like deserves to be on this roster and Jordy Pifok. But right now he's dodging us. We'll keep trying. We'll keep mm-hmm. trying. But uh, that's what's happening right now. So hit us up with any questions. If you're watching this live right now on the YouTubes and the comments, I know there's already one out there and Charlie was very, very adamant to answer it. Charlie, you did some high school wrestling and somebody wanted to know how that helped you become Wait, a better can player. You, Jimmy, can you ask how I'm doing? I'm, I, you know how I'm doing today? <laughs> I know how you're doing. Look at that mustache. It's nice. Uh, I, 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 I'm rearranging my background, so it's a little bit ugly. But here's a picture of uh, Thomas Dooley sitting in the uh, – sitting oh, in uh, Jimmy's favorite teammate. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I didn't play. Jimmy with mentored Thomas him. Really. Jim, Jimmy mentored him. <laughs> so you know, of course, he's got a <laughs> sweet. He's got a soft spot in his heart for him. You know. Sorry, oh, I'm good man. now. Thanks for asking. Okay, I'm glad, Go I'm, ahead, I'm, I'm glad you're doing it well, Heath. <laughs> Charlie, tell us about your your wrestling and how how uh, that helped you become a better footballer, as it were. Wrestling was phenomenal. Think about the the conditioning it takes to become a a solid wrestler, and then throw in the mental toughness. You're on the mat. There's no teammates. You have to be good at wrestling. One, you have to have the mental toughness to push your 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 body to the to the limit. You got wait wait, wait 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 wait. I yeah. thought wrestling was staged. Like you jumping off the top oh, no. rope. What's happening? No, here? no, like, this is on? the real. What? This is the Olympic wrestling. Turn, <laughs> turn buckle, Olympic wrestling. Oh, yeah. turnbuckle oh, Charlie okay. over here. Turnbuckle oh, Charlie over here. Right. Yeah, this, right. no, this, this isn't this isn't this isn't the Rock throwing the people's elbows. <laughs> Chuck, <Yeah. not> Chuck, <laughs> Chuck, this isn't Chuck Mania. No, no, this isn't Chuck Mania. This is like getting on the mat and you gotta you gotta grind it out. I think I, I really learned how to use my body um, in terms of just having the balance to use your strength, use someone else's strength who might be stronger than you against them. Um, and, and just, I think just the mental toughness aspect of never counting yourself out. And, um, you know, I didn't have the greatest technique in the beginning. I was really quick. I was going to say strong. that. I watched some of that video and I, it didn't seem like you had great technique, but yeah, uh, but, <laughs> That's a, but, I was thinking the same thing. thing. But, then, yeah. but then, but then with hard work, the technique came through and, uh, I, I finished third in the country in wrestling. Wow. Um, wow. We there, dropping so. suplexes on people. Like what's yeah. the, <laughs> what's your signature move, Charlie? So I had a bear hug that I was, I was extremely good at. And then, Charlie uh, Bear Hug Davies. We got a new nickname for you. And, and then I had, uh, there's this technique called legs. So you, you wrap one leg in between um, the, the other person's legs who's below you. And you just crank on them with your, your upper body. And, uh, oh, man. You got those quads. Could you imagine? Yeah. Could you Literally, imagine just... Charlie's legs wrapping around you like an anaconda <laughs> and you just having to wait until you can't breathe anymore? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Uh, bro, I wrap my legs. Man. It's called double legs. And they are they are done. You are you are flat to the, the mat. You cannot move. It is, it is yeah, what, the worst feeling. So wait, wait, wait. You got, what you was got your weight the... class? What was your weight class? Yeah, was your weight... You had a weight class? Yeah. So my freshman year is 112 pounds. Okay. And my senior year, I was 145 pounds. Okay. 
Jimmy, what'd you uh, wrestle at? Like 65, 70 pounds? <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> something wet. <laughs> with, I, with, I the just, winter, with, a, with a winter coat on. Uh, I, yeah, I was actually, what, you said third in the country. Did you mean third in the Royal Rumble? Like, what is that? Like, no, so in my weight class, what? I finished okay. third in prep, prep nationals. Uh, and prep I lost, nationals. I wow. lost in the semifinals to a four-time champion. So he had wow. won in every year he wrestled, he won the national championship. His name was Rudy Ray. I'll never forget and and uh did he go I on to do anything he just wrestled at, at american university um okay. he, ended, I, he ended up at I psg took, he, I took he was them, at psg for a little while i took him all the way he, he typically okay. pinned he pinned everyone he wrestled not me um I, I took him all the way through the three periods and i, I was like man that's an accomplishment and if had i been on the other side of the bracket i would have lost to him in the final so okay um, so Ch I'll chuck answer it. answer this do you feel more comfortable in spandex or soccer shorts? Like, what's your? Come on, I, I feel. <laughs> hey, when you when you wrestle in a singlet, you can yeah. be comfortable in anything. Yeah. So when yeah. when did when did they start adding hot oil to your matches? Because I, 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 I <laughs> is that was that like a rule change at some point? Because you know they were pinning hey. pinning pinning. pinning what was your walkout music? What's your walkout music, Chuck? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I wrestled a kid who had covered himself like doused himself in oil and <laughs> anytime you try to grab him he just slipped it's off like of a you. slip and slide it, it, that's I, exactly I, and, and, you know, he, and he was one of the better wrestlers in that weight class and I was, obviously because you can't grab year, him yeah and you couldn't you couldn't grab him he was just yeah. slippery I, I i will say this uh, just a story about multiple sports uh i've played and i, I think you guys have both played pick up soccer with steve nash and when you talk about the way in which multiple sports, because maybe you guys, maybe you guys feel differently and you're like one sport all the way. That's how you train the best players and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But when I watched him play and it's small sided and it's relatively the size of what you would play at a basketball court in terms of the perimeter, working the perimeter, a little bit more like that tactical game, but the way in which he used his body to drive the ball forward and knew exactly if he could get an inch past you and get his arm around you, that you could no longer take that space back. It was like I was watching a soccer player, a basketball player play soccer. And very rarely do you see sort of some sort of application of those types of things. But it was a real thing to me that I was like, man, the way in which this guy can occupy and swim through tight spaces. And obviously the bigger game doesn't always play like that. But you think about a striker in the box creating a, a half inch here, half inch there, or they're establishing Charlie, you as a striker to, to get your body into a space and not allow somebody in. I was mind blown by it. And I've got, you know, I played with him for a couple of years now before he took the, the basketball, uh, the head coaching job for the Nets. But I just, every time I watched, I was like, there's something to this. And I played multiple sports growing up, but watching him at an elite level, obviously a first ballot Hall of Famer in, in the NBA, use space in a way that I've never seen a soccer player use mm -hmm. space because that's what he knew was a really impressive thing that like, it just blew my mind that we don't have more direct application. Now he's a special case, right? He is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Like he is an elite world-class athlete, but it just got my mind spinning on like, Man, imagine if he went the soccer route but still had, you know, went through like Santa Clara basketball or something like that and played soccer. Like what could he have taken at an elite level from one thing to the next that was directly applicable? And that was one that I was just I was just mind well, blown. I can that. tell you one thing right right now, direct that's direct apl applicable to this situation is I played Pop Warner football. And as a wide receiver, you have to make runs. And so as a striker, I took a lot out of out of me running routes to to make sure I'm I'm juking out my uh, defender to get into an open spot. It's the same thing as a striker when you're trying to make a run and the timing has to be right. Like the quarterback throws it, timing. So there's a lot of things at uh, football and a running back trying to juke somebody out. You have the ball in your on your feet instead of in your hands. I mean, it's the same thing. And I think that helped Shoot. me in the 1v1 situation. Now I guess that I means only that. Aronson. Hold on, Jimmy. That means only Aronson and Wea could play football because they're the only, only ones making runs right now in the National <laughs> well, well, Aronson, Everybody else checking Aronson back. Aronson won't hit. That, that, he's done. Yeah. But everybody's I doing mean, five yards and checking back and saying, like, feed me. You know, like, no one's doing that. No one's doing the old school run. I, to the I'm more flag, of a button you know? hook guy. You know, you want to button hook him a little bit. But now that reminds me why Chuck was doing swim moves during training on me when I was trying to get close <laughs> yeah. to him. This swim move in me yeah. as a wide receiver. I could see you being a, a quality punter, Jim. A punter of all yeah. the goddamn positions, yeah. you said. I <laughs> yeah, I like kind of liken myself oh. as a safety. I always liked Ronnie Lott back in the day. To be honest, that oh, guy was yeah. just, was a menace. Yeah, yeah Thomas Dooley. Yeah, sweet for that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Before we get to our next question, we do want to let you know that there are some big games obviously happening for our player pool. Mainly that I'm paying attention to, guys, is the Yunus Musa. Is he going to be back for Valencia? Cameron Carter Vickers. What's his injury status? Uh, we also have. Jedi Robinson, 
We have Chris Richards. We have Reggie Cannon, Timo Weah, like Gio Reyna. What are these guys doing? Are they going to be playing? Are they going to be on the bench? Like, what, what is their progress? That's something I'm keeping an eye on. And then I think the, the straight matchup everybody should be watching this weekend is Juventus taking on AC Milan because we could have Weston McKinney taking on Serginho Dest in that one, and that would be very, very cool to watch and see. So obviously, those will be the things we'll be talking about on Monday or some of the things we'll be talking about. But we want to keep getting to your questions. Here's another one yeah. for us. This is from Jack on the Twitters. And Heath, I'll come to you first on this. Do you think Greg sticks with one captain in Qatar or continues his revolving door method? Seems like there's a lack of leadership because the captaincy is continually changing. I mean, look, whether you wear the captain's band or not, there's a lot of people that have gotten captain's band on all the teams we played on that you're like, no way. You know, that's not a leader. But <laughs> leaders lead. Leaders lead in different ways, right? Some are rah, rah, rah. Some lead by example. Some are quiet leaders. Some are the ones that... In the face of death, you look it in the eyes and they calm you, right? And you know exactly, they're going to know exactly the one word to say or the thing to say to keep you in matches. So I don't really care who wears the band. And maybe you guys care about what that means optically or whatever. Uh, so I'd love for you guys to, to, to answer that as well. But for me, uh, the revolving thing, maybe it's a signal. Maybe when things are going bad, we read into it where it's like, oh yeah, that guy didn't do it or, or that guy hasn't led good enough. I think that's more of Greg saying, these are our leaders. These are our go-tos. It also has implications of like who can talk to the ref and who can like you know whatever throughout the game and that's why um i try not to read into who wears the captain's band but i do think there's a lack of leadership but i don't think it's like depends on like you know i go and give it to charlie and charlie charlie you know rips off his shirt and now he's you know the the leader that we want him to be and he's like okay now i gotta embrace this you're like no it's more of a reward than it is a responsibility i guess uh, is the way i would see it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, okay I, what I about you guys question in, in you in in the comments on youtube who was the best captain you've ever played with that's a great question robert marici and shout out to gabe i see you in here for manchester who's the Hanger. best shout captain out. we've ever had on our team that's a great question i mean jimmy i thought you know I, I thought it's Boca not very often that it's, awesome. it's it's not that very often that you that that charlie and i say nice things to you jimmy but i think you were a fantastic captain personally oh thank in you very much just like being uh and it was short-lived you and i i mean a little national team but also short-lived with, with with chivas but just that there is a responsibility that comes sometimes with captains uh, that are good leaders to have a holistic view of what's going on, right? You represent mm -hmm, a little mm -hmm. bit of the coaching staff, but you represent your players. And you got to know when to be honest, when to be hard. You're almost like a coach at times, a good, a good, a good uh, captain, right? You, you know, some players what's, need to be buttered well, up. Yeah, some exactly. Need to, you, know, <laughs> you know, some need, yeah. some need to be, uh, you know, tough love. And I thought that you did a good job of keeping perspective, always moving forward um and but but continuing to like not skip steps or or hard conversations or be you know not afraid to yell at somebody in training but also not afraid to wrap your arm around somebody when somebody did good and i think that's a really hard thing to do in a very it's a team sport but positionally you can become very you know um horse blinders and and focused on yourself and selfish right because you got to be to get to a certain level so i think Good leaders, at least to me, and Carlos Bocanegra, I know you just mentioned that, Charlie, was is, is another one that had the ability to step back at times and address you and not always in the context of, of a moment, which I think is really important. I, I I don't know how much my mom paid you to say that, but uh, it was it was very nice. Thank you. Thank, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Bocanegra is a good one. What's funny about Carlos and I, we played together at UCLA when he was a freshman. I was a senior. We went on to win the national championship. That's a flex alert. Also... We're having a 25, if I can, I can't believe I'm saying this, 25 year uh, reunion of that coming up here, October 20th, when UCLA takes on Cal and all the guys are going. But Boca Negra obviously is a little busy, so I don't know if he's going to be there. Are you I'm, going? I'm going to go. Rimando is going to be there. Matt Reese, Kevin Hart. Wait, why would he be busy? They're out of the playoffs. You know what? You can text him and find out. We, we haven't put enough pressure on him, obviously, but maybe he'll surprise <laughs> us and come. But, but uh, it's interesting. Uh, in terms of captains and, and who you – you learn. I think you learn from everybody, even the shitty captains. In terms of, I wouldn't have handled myself like that. I wouldn't have said. I and I don't mind saying names. John Doyle was a guy that was definitely worried about his own patch of grass, and I learned that very early on that he's going to be good at what he does. And if you suck, man, that that's your career. And I wonder if it's less about him, John Doyle, as a person, and more just about that's just how you had to survive at that time of the game or, or the development of the game in this country. Whereas every man for themselves, because there was so little money around 
to 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 go get to the players, I feel like it was a sink or swim type thing, and you, you were, didn't really want to lift up the guys next to you because you didn't want them to play better and then ultimately take the money that that you thought you deserved. So I, I don't blame him as a person so much. I think it was more just the environment and where he cut his teeth. Yeah. But I learned a lot from him, and I remember him shutting me down a few times, like enough of that rah rah bullshit. You're just a rookie. You don't have to open your mouth and and. Uh, and I learned, I take little notes after feeling sorry for myself that I would never treat anybody else like that if I ever became captain. So I think mm -hmm, that yeah. definitely bore some fruit. But but there you can learn a little bit from, from guys that maybe even didn't wear the captain's armband. I remember when Claudio Lopez played for Kansas City. Obviously, the guy played for Argentina and Club America and Valencia and like just decorated careers. And you just, how he carries himself, right? Just these little things that you're taking to your point a little bit about uh, was it Steve Nash, Keith, about mm -hmm. just in terms of, I mean, that's more about spatial awareness, but even just in how they carry themselves, it, 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 it makes a difference. And you do take notes on if I ever become a leader of consequence, I want to carry myself similarly. I guess, I guess it, it is harder. It is harder said than done though, because when you do take on that responsibility, it can be hard to always like, it, it, it's very easy. We see coach, I would coach differently. I would do it differently. But when you have to wrap it all up and actually do it consistently, it does take time, right? It's not just a matter of like, I take this from that person, I take that and I eliminate all this because you still have some of your own habits that you have to break out mm -hmm, of, right? Mm -hmm. As a leader. And I'd also say in, in saying that the the, co the captains that I've had that have made the biggest difference that I've seen work. And then uh, I saw Julius, you, you asked on the YouTube section, what makes a bad captain? Well, in college, I had this captain, Guy Malamed. He was drafted by the Rapids. All right, give it his names. I like that. Israeli. <laughs> he was like a twenty. He was a twenty-four-year-old senior in in college because they. Go, was know, he a doctor? Billy they go the Madison. Military in, in Israel. <laughs> oh, in Israel, yeah, you go in the, the army. So, he. I remember he taught me an important lesson. I was dribbling, and you know. In college, there are some players who aren't that great, won't be one. And so I was kind of taking the piss and doing all these step overs and Megan and laughing. And he just came in and just chased me for like two minutes in this small side of game to try and cleat me anytime I got mm -hmm. the ball. And one time he, he came close and I said, what the hell is that? And he goes, play the game the way it's supposed to play, be played. When you're in a game, you treat training like it is a match. You don't disrespect your opponents like this. Play the game the right way. And that always resonated with me. I'd say great captain. Example of a captain who's who's teaching a valuable lesson to a young up and coming player within the squad. And then I look forward at Carlos Bocanegra. This is a guy who could work with two different groups in the national team because there was almost like two clicks. You could even say three clicks, and he could he could kind of be in all three, and everyone had had his attention, or he had everyone's attention. And then for me, I'd always complain to him and say, Carlos, why is Bob always yelling at me? He's always <laughs> on me. I can be on the opposite side of the pitch, and he's not involved in our 5v2 hour possession, and he's screaming at me. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? And he goes, because he sees something in you, it, he wouldn't say a damn thing if he didn't think that you, would, you were going to be you know, something special. So I know it sucks. Just deal with it. So That's like, hard to believe, though. That's hard to believe, too, though, where you're like, you know, it's when coaches go like, it's when I'm quiet that you should be worried. And you're like, nah, yeah, but I'm also worried when you're yelling at me, you know, like I, I, you, <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the whole like Bob saying, oh, I was OK. You know, I'm yeah. like, are you, are you I'm supposed to turn that into or... like uh, unicorns and rainbows and be like, oh, he said the nicest thing. You're still thinking like, what did he say? What does yeah. it mean? And then and then in terms of bad captains, we've seen it. A player who is probably Only worried about more, themselves. More talented players. Right. And the coach says, I'm going to give this captain to try and get him to be bought into the team and be right. like held accountable. And it does nothing. And and we've seen a lot of players who are just selfish, only care about themselves and their stats and and, ha and could care less about leading a group and, and uplifting others instead of putting people down. Yeah, that's uh, there's so many. I think we have a lot of stories and I'm, I actually want to dive in about your three clicks on the national team. But maybe we can save that for. Uh, uh, another time. Now, those clicks just naturally evolve as as you start to gravitate towards people that that you like spending time with. So I understand where you're coming from, but clicks can also be detrimental to some team environments as well. Not to say that it was. I'm just saying that it could. All right, let's get into another question. Uh, Andrew in the chat says, "Who is the out of left field player that's going to make the World Cup roster?" for the U.S. when it gets announced on November 9th. Charlie, I'm going to come back to you. Heath, you can think about this for a second. It, in that bucket of, 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 of possibilities, it's Jordan Pifok is one of them. 
and that would catch everybody off guard being like, oh, would it though? Okay. I mean, everybody yeah, expects it, it though. Okay. No, I, I think well, it expects would. that he should or thinks they should. He should Tim, be in there. Already. Tim Ream. That would be out of left field. I would say probably at this moment, uh, Sean Johnson, because hmm. Ethan Horvath and Zach Steffen and Matt Turner are the top. Good three. shout. Good shout. And then I'd say Joe Scally, Jordan Morris. Um, Ariola? I, I, I think Ariola. Well, what, 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 what's crazy, though, Charlie, is you asked who's the player, and you're, asked, you're talking all the French players. So give us a player. <laughs> who's the guy? You know? You're giving us all the French, which I actually think is great context because I wouldn't have thought of those players. But uh, yeah, I'm I mean, just saying, I, this I, is the pool. Okay. I, I so take, who would one? Is it PFOC? Yeah, it's a PFOC. I do think PFOC is left field just because it's never is made sense to not. I mean, Jimmy, it's never made sense to not bring a player in and go like, I know what I got from them. I'm going to save them for the World Cup when they're in top Yeah, form. no, I get you it. You know what I mean? Like, I know we're trying to justify that. It's like Greg knows what he's got from there and he needs to make some other decisions, which is also true, right? We needed to see Sargent. We need to yeah. see Ferreira. We need to see Pepe. I get that. But at the same time, you go, yeah, but then just bring an extra player in the camp. Bring a 28th player. Bring a 29th player. Who's going to stop you? Like, right? Mm -hmm. Bring the players in that are part of the group. It's crucial hours that they're hanging out in the locker room. They're hanging out on the field. They're hanging out in the, around the hotel. They're spending time together. They're gelling. They're forming. And that's a really important factor. And so I do think that's a that's a left field shot for me also. Yeah, I don't I don't really have anybody else. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I, it, I, out, of, out of left field? Is, like Sergeant, would be is, Sergeant, is Sergeant left field? I don't or, think he or, is. I don't think he is. I don't know if he's is, a lock yet. I think he's a lock. Scallywag, would that be out of left field? I mean, I think there's there's reasons why you would bring him because he can he can he can play on both sides. Not that you want to see him play on both sides. There's something about Sammy Vines because he's our that would that would be way out of left field. All of a sudden, yeah, Sammy agree. Vines is number 26 because Anthony's a little hurt going into the World Cup, and we just want a proper left sided player. Oh. I that would be way way out of hey, left field. I, Jimmy, you might uh, you you can take us to break here, but I think uh, after that we can go to uh, uh, omissions. Shocking omissions, I think, is an even yeah. bigger, bigger question, which all is right, kind of a right, fun all one. Right. All right. So so Heath is hosting the show. Now we're going to take our first and only break of In Soccer We Trust. When do we return? We're going to answer more of your questions because that's what we're doing, baby. It's mailbag time here on your favorite podcast. Don't go anywhere. The UEFA Champions League on Paramount Plus. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, exhilaration. That's brilliant. With more magic and more drama. While a former Bavarian nailed the back of the net in Barcelona, an American trades his stars with zebra stripes, and a Norwegian creates sky blue spectacles. Oh, so stream every sweat, so second of regulation time, stoppage time, and extra time. Beyond magnificent. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount Plus. Welcome back to It's Soccer We Trust. I'm Jimmy Conrad alongside Charlie Davies and Heath Pierce. If you haven't hit like and or subscribe, please do that now. If you're not following Your us on Twitter, ISWT Pod. Yes, my co-host, Charlie Davies and Hollywood Heath Pierce. Hit us up on Twitter at ISWT Pod. Drop us a follow there. Hit uh, subscribe on any podcast platform of your choice. That would be awesome. Five-star reviews. Gladly take them. Thank you very much. And uh, we want to keep building up this community, not only in the 2022 World Cup or leading up to it, but also afterwards. Because obviously we got we got four years of a run-up to 2026. Plenty to talk about and to dissect as always. So there is uh, the question that Heath wanted to address prior to the break. It's the biggest... Sorry for omission. guiding us, Jimmy. Sorry for no, guiding us fine. to the break. You're I fine. just... You're if fine. we don't have, I, if we don't I, have I didn't look at the time. a time limit, gonna a, if we don't yeah. have a time limit on our answers, on, on. we're going to do three questions per mailbag episode, you know, and we might well need to get some parameters. Well you're well on the clock. Well shock, well shock omissions. Shock omissions. Charlie, you got one minute. You're on the clock. You got it, Charlie. Go ahead. Shock omissions. Shock omissions. You're going to, you're going to say Ricardo Pepe. No, I think he goes. Josh Sargent. That wouldn't be a shock to me. Really? That would yeah. be my shock mission, I think. Sergeant. I don't think he goes. I think I think Pulisic would be my shock mission. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. you know, I'm dead inside, so nothing shocks me, guys. <laughs> there, there, for me, there's no shocks. No shocks. There's no. There, there, Zach, Zach Steffen? Who, who, you you <laughs> Zach have to Steffen. tell me a shock. A shock mission is a player who's been included in the group for, from – Kellen Acosta. Qualifying to now and is not going to go. There's not one player. There's Jordan not one. Morris. Not one player he'd be shocked about. 
I mean, we could lose somebody. Oh, okay. We could, we could Ari- lose somebody Ari- Would Ariola? Would Ariola be a shock? Not necessarily because you want him there, but because of his role with Greg Berhalter, and we know that Greg likes him. If he didn't go, would that be a shock? A guy that he's gone to the most caps under Greg Berhalter? Yeah, I'd be shocked. I, I would be shocked. Somebody I just wanted to preface that because somebody somebody might get hurt. Stage. Somebody might be hurt. I mean, we saw well, yesterday got announced that, that Kyle Walker, who and I mentioned it yesterday. I mean, he could be out. Yeah, but that's that, not a shock omission though, because he's, he's that's injured. true. They got hurt. You got to be healthy. In, that's true. Be, so, so yeah. like it's a it's a decision that was made, not an yeah. Like you're you're cut. You're cut. People are saying Burhalter is going to be the shock omission. Like he's <laughs> no, out. He's no, just going to resign before the world. You know, I've had enough. There's only so many bounce passes and yeah. cool shoes you can yeah. wear. I've I've run out of shoes. I have no I've, shoes to wear for the world. I've Cup. taken I've taken this project as far as I can, guys. I think you're on yeah, your Luke, own. Luke, Luca Della Torre is a good one. Because he's not that'd playing. be a shock. Not that'd playing, shock. not used. Um, you know, with 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 Greg. Um I think if Malik Tillman had been doing more in those big games for Rangers, I think we'd be talking a lot more about Tillman than De La Torre. But but because mm. he didn't do a lot there and, and Greg came out and said something about it publicly. That he was disappointed that he didn't like raise his game to that level. I think De La Torre is still in. You know what's crazy? I, I, and he should in be early qualifying, going into early qualifying, I would have said that Sebastian Legette not making the World Cup would have been a shock back then. The way That's that fair. he was used, the way that he was used under Greg Berhalter, he was one that I was like, oh yeah, this is the guy. This is his guy that he knows for that cycle. I'm going to put him in. I know exactly what I'm going to get. No high highs, no low lows. He's going to play multiple roles, positions, whatever. He's going to do exactly what I say. He's experienced. And and then it was just done. Uh, I'd say that, I'd say the Nations League was was the end of of him. Like Jackson Ewell, remember Jackson Ewell and Sebastian and Sebastian Lejet were were starter or playing in the Nations League, and then they were dropped out. So that was kind of like the moment where they both dropped out. All right, let's keep these questions going because to Heath's point, we'll only answer three of them for an hour. <laughs> Who scores the first World Cup goal? And I assume they're referencing. The U.S. Men's National Team, Heath, you can go first. <laughs> Man, I, I, honestly, like I'm racking my. I mean, this is the worst time in the history of the U.S. Men's National Team to ask who's scoring the first goal in a World Cup when we don't score goals in the probably a set Cup. piece. But, but I would say I, I was thinking McKinney, but part of me was also like, you know what? Maybe Christian Pulisic rises to that occasion and he's gonna de- he's gonna deliver. But as as I kind of wrap around the midfield, it could be two fifteen today. Man, I don't know, man. It, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, yeah. I guess I would go with. Uh, I'm gonna go with Pulisic just because. Pulisic, huh? Yeah, I, I just don't see who who else is. And maybe it would be a Zimmerman or a, or a McKinney on a, on a, on a set Steph piece. Geese. But I'm thinking in the run of play, I would. I'm, I am gonna go with Pulisic to deliver, man. I mean, Pulisic oh, in the oh, run only of play. because he's got he's got the he, to me he's got that Landon Donovan vibe where it's like might it's not have the best of first games, but that ball's going to pop into a space and he's going to bury it and run to the corner flag. We're all going to celebrate and we're going to win the World Cup, guys. That's it. It's a Christmas miracle. How about you, Charlie? Who's going to the World Cup? Nice you? And sorry, before, if you heard I mean, any I'm noise, that was, that was Charlie talking to his personal assistant. Many, I think you have, <laughs> what, three or four of those? <laughs> what? what? You I'm going to go West McKinney. McKinney. All yeah. right. West McKinney. Okay. Set piece, run a play. Or run doesn't play. matter. Run a run play. play. Okay, I like mm-hmm. it. I like it. Hmm. Clutch. I team. think to I like blow that. people's minds for their minds to melt. Matt Turner. Dest. You're gonna go Dest. <laughs> no, I'm going the number nine. Jesus Ferreira, baby. He's gonna okay. find the back of the net, and then he can shush all the haters on the way to the quarter. Charlie, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be wild. Charlie, how's I mean that's how's what we Ferreira all are gonna score from the bench, man. How's where, where's he? <laughs> <laughs> he could come off the bench and score too. I don't know. That but is I'm gonna, true. That is I true. could. Can I? If I could, if you allow me to say this, the the number nine will score. Then that kind of gives me a couple options. But but I'll just yeah. go. Out, I'll, put, put, I'll put my. I'll put it out there and say I'll, Jesus I'll, Ferreira. I'll, I'll give you the few. I'll I'll give you the number nine position because that's probably a, a hotter take right now than than Charlie's or mine. It's just I'll, I'll give it. you three strikers. I'll uh, take, I'll take the score. number nine just to yeah, kind of okay. just because it would be awesome because we struggled so much in that position to score consistently and to take our chances when they come. I'm gonna take the blanket number nine. He's they're gonna score first and it's gonna be awesome. And you guys can remember this podcast once uh, it happens. Fair. Yeah, people, get your receipts ready. <laughs> get the receipts ready. <laughs> All right, so another question here is with regard to Wales. Is there anybody that we're really afraid of? I got this on Twitter from from a Welsh fan who basically said, uh, "Where did it? Where did it go?" Like, excluding on, on the Wales squad. 
Yeah, like excluding Bale and Ramsey, which player from Wales are you mindful of, and which would you rather? There's only one, and that's Daniel James, just because of his pace. Um, he get he can get in behind. Other than that, you're not you're not worried about a single player on Wales. Well, there's one. There's there's a six foot five Kiefer Moore that plays the number nine that can just slam dunk headers. And given that I lived through the 2006 experience and saw it with Jan Kohler, who's also like well, he's six foot eight and slam dunked on us when Czech Republic beat us three zero. I, I, it's just, it doesn't, um, Gooch was back there, Eddie Pope was back there. Like, he just, if you got a big dude and the cross is good, it's just really hard to defend. Yeah, but are so, you worried about that? Point? Well, I'm just saying that's a guy that, well, one, he can neutralize us on set pieces defensively, right? And then on attacking wise, we just got to get a body around him. I don't know. Am I, am I worried, worried? Not, no, I'm Come not on. really worried. But I also want to be thoughtful of, okay, if Daniel James is, is, to your point, or Gareth Bale is occupying a lot of space and all of a sudden they can get crosses off to this big Harry dude. Harry Maguire. I don't know. Harry. Gabe, Gabe is saying Dan James is incredibly fast, but he really can't finish. Well, and yeah. uh, we'll take that. In the World Cup, all it takes is, is one crazy run, and the shot goes off the off a, a defender deflection, and, and there's a tap-in. I mean, it's just a player that can create havoc. He, he causes problems with his pace. That alone – is worrisome considering our outside backs are so involved in our attack and so so involved with providing our width that occasionally it's it could take a center back having to come out of out of position he gets beat and then you're one v one one v two one v three it's it's not ideal and, and that's why you know we might have to change our tactics in the world cup i mean it's great and all when you can keep possession, but that's not our strength. I think we all know that, especially hearing yeah. from Jermaine yesterday. We just got to defend and counter, counter and win in transition and not be so uh, kind of obsessed with being in the opponent's half and keeping the ball when players don't – I don't think necessarily built, all our players feel comfortable with the ball. Yeah, we're feet, built right? to run, baby. We're built to run. Jimmy, I got I, a question I, for you. Well, well, really quick. I just want to throw yeah. in that the Kiefer Moore just scored a couple weeks ago against Belgium. So it's not like Whatever. he's... Whatever. I'm just saying. It's not like he's some... <laughs> he plays for Bournemouth right now in the Premier League. Only one goal in seven games. But but I just... That would be a person that I would... Well, I'm a center yeah. back, so I'm always thinking about yeah. other strikers. But go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Heath. Uh, knowing that we go into every World Cup thinking that uh, we're going to play with our eleven. And it never happens, right? You almost use all your players generally in a group stage, um, uh -huh, or at least like uh -huh. 18 of them. Do you think there'll be a lot of rotation? Uh, uh, you know, either of you guys think that there'll be a lot of rotation, Jimmy, starting with you? Just in terms of like, okay, maybe not your center backs. Maybe your center backs, right? Okay, maybe your central three is the same. Maybe you're in yellow card trouble. You know, maybe you could rotate your strikers or your wingers or depending on who you're playing. Do you think there'll be seven, eight player changes? Not in seven no, or eight, no. seven, eight, three or four, no. but like eight over a couple of games? I don't see that unless unless you have a a draw against Wales and you're going into the England game and you're almost like we're going to concede it, but we're going to make some changes. Maybe there's a couple of guys that picked up yellow, so you're not going to play them against England because you want to make sure that you have them for Iran. And, and then some of those players end up doing well against England. Maybe you get a surprise draw, somebody, you know, and you made four, five changes. You're heading into the last game against Iran. Then you're like, what do we do? You know, the, the, players that played well and took that opportunity against the, the strongest yeah. team in the group, do you take them off all of a sudden? Do you go back to the guys who maybe didn't play as well against, you know, those are the the, the questions that, you know, you, you got to start preparing for. And that's probably plan B, plan C in, in the grand scheme of things. It, it, if we finish 1-1-1, one, one, and one, goal difference is going to probably be pretty pivotal. So I wonder if we draw Wales – and then we go into that England game, to your point, Charlie, where we not necessarily expecting to lose, but we're going to be thoughtful not to get too stretched because we don't want to lose by three, right? Yeah. Because we want to give ourselves a chance in that last game against Iran to win it and take our four points and book our ticket to the next round. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a direct answer to your question, Heath, and we always like to tap dance around uh, answering directly anyway. That's part of our charm over here. But I would say that I could see a center back change. From from one game to the next, based on the opponent. Like if we do see a key for more against Wales, do we want a Cameron Carter Vickers against him? Because maybe they're around the same size, the way that they Wales tries to attack space. Isn't him and Cameron Zimmerman. Carter Vickers five ten. No, he's bigger than that, isn't he? No, he's 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 on the smaller side for a center back. No way. Yeah. 
He looks like a giant out there. No. Mm -mm. Wait, wait, wait. I'm looking it up right now. He's 6'1". It's pretty it's, – it's not bad. He's a small 6'1", though. Okay. Well, I'll let you tell him to that to his face when he ever comes on the show. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're a small center back, dude. <laughs> uh, so, so – Cameron Carter, I mean, that's just a player. Okay. I mean, if, if it's, if we think that that's where Cameron Carter Vickers is strong, you know, it just, I think it's situational in some ways. And then England obviously going to provide a different type of opponent. And I could see a switching to center backs midfield. I think is going to stay the same unless somebody gets hurt. And then the wingers, I think there's going to be some rotation and the number nine as well, potentially. So I could see three or four changes per game. Is that, <laughs> does that feel too many? That feels like too many, maybe. Yeah, I mean, but England's going to be that oh shit moment, right? We like our chances against England until the day before England, we look at that lineup and we go, oh man, that's, that's, that's England. You know, that's a big England. Uh, and so you got to make tough decisions. You're going to play them straight up. You're going to bunker. You're going to counter. We, we've struggled now with a high press. We've struggled against low blocks. Like, how are we going to play straight up? Or are for we, me, uh, you know, go, go for, hard. For me against England, we're, we're doing exactly what we've always been good at. It's in our DNA, sitting back, trying to hit him on a counter, try to score on a set piece. Like that is, that is us. We just got to do it collectively with a lot of energy and with a lot of pride. And you're going to get everybody behind you to, to win that game. There's no question with that. It's the Wales and Iran game that I think are trickiest for us because how do we actually want to play in those? Do we want to play to our DNA or do we want to try to evolve in some ways and try to keep possession as we've tried to do against Japan and Saudi Arabia? Not to great effect. Those are the games that I think are the trickiest. The England one for me is pretty like black and white. Like they're going to be the ones that are the protagonists. They're going to try to, they're going to be on the front foot. We're on the back foot and we have the guys to run. We might actually have our best performance against England because we're actually staying truer to our DNA or at least this collection of players and what we're best at than the ones we're maybe trying to do more than we're capable of. And I don't, I mean that as kindly as possible because we do have moments where we can play around a lot of people, but I don't know if it's sustainable currently with this group because our group just likes to run. We got runners. Charlie, any, any thoughts on that before we move to the next one? And, and I'm going to give you the next question while you're adding to that. So you can just roll right into that. Which player getting injured would hurt the most for the squad? Mm. Tyler Adams for me. Tyler Adams. Yeah, I don't think there's but, anybody there. Yunus, the Yunus, Musa Leadership. Right, Yunus Musa is right there. Yeah, I was um, going to say your favorite player, Tyler Adams, or yeah. your favorite player? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite player to watch is Eunice Musa, okay. the most important okay. player on this team. There we go. Adams. That's the distinction yeah. we've yeah, been there looking There we go. For. I love it, Charlie. I've been so confused go. for a few days now, and you've now made that clear for me. Sometimes Thank you so it's much. very hard for you guys to get it. but here <laughs> here He's on go. another level, Jimmy. You know, you We know? just got to try to get that context out of him so we can understand it. You know? That's <laughs> good. Nothing but love for you. So guys. Adams. Everybody ab Adams. I think um, Adams. I think yeah. so. I think so, too. I just I, – only because – Everywhere else, I think we almost have a, not a like for like, but we have something applicable. We don't have a, anything close to an Adams. Um, no matter what you put in, the style and the way in which this team will go to get results will not be anywhere near the same, period. Mm -hmm. How about Jedi and, and, Robinson? We got no, some well, shots well, from Tyler. A, well, for, that's the thing with Jedi Robinson. If Jedi's out, if Serginho Dest is out, you have to change the responsibilities for your your left back and your right back. It has to change. So you're no longer saying if Chris Richards is all of a sudden playing left back, go ahead and bomb forward and whip balls in. No, you're staying no. home. No, you're pick defending. and choose your moments. Well, defend first, lock down the shop. If the game yes. presents it where you can get high and wide, like take the space the game gives you, but like play smart. Uh, but yeah. again, when you think about no Jedi Robinson, I go, well, Chris Richards, okay. At least I know I'm going to have a top level defender well, in that position. You, you, you know? could almost move into a back three in some ways in, in the attack, right? Where Richards could then occupy the left side. And then you're just pushing Serginho Dest up a little bit higher. So there are ways to, to get around it. I'm actually looking at the USA Portugal, a 2002 one world cup. Cause that was the game where I believe we had Frankie Haydick just following Louis Figo around. Like, that was the game plan. Like, Frankie, you're just going to sit on Louis Figo no matter where he goes. But if he switches sides, doesn't matter. We'll adjust according to where yeah, he but, is. But Figo wasn't good, was he? No, he, he wasn't was good because... Come on, Christopher I mean, Walken. I've, I've heard in, him. I've in heard the him. comments, he, he totally yeah. agree, disagrees with us. And if if Tyler Adams gets hurt, then you play Musa in a spot. Musa no, is not, not the a same defensive play. midfielder. No, he no, can't win no. challenges like Tyler Look, Adams. He doesn't cover this, ground this like is, Tyler uh, This is Christopher Walken's first L of a comment. Yeah, a L. Big, come you got to get me out. We're not, L. Me, but we're not talking L. about build up. We're not talking about Tyler Adams and build up. You know, we're, we're talking about Tyler Adams in transition. Tyler Adams running out to the sideline to put out a fire. Tyler Adams yeah, tracking defending. back in transition. Yes. All That's what we're talking the about. The intangibles, too. He's also yeah, a great exactly. leader. You lose that leadership. One, Who else is our one, leader on the field? The number one most important 
aspect of that position is protecting the back four. You are balanced. Ooh, you are back four needs protecting balanced. too right now. So Tyler Adams is the most important player in this group. Yeah. Come on, walk in. I agree. I agree. Okay, so let's tie up this podcast, this very special mailbag podcast of In Soccer We Trust with this last question, because I'm sure we'll talk about it for a few minutes, and then we'll let everybody enjoy their beautiful weekend. We'll see you on the other side of it on Monday. Heath, I'll come to you first. What do you think would be considered a good World Cup for the U.S. men's national team? Weirdly, give me, I, give me some I, details. I, no, don't yeah, give yeah, me that yeah, while yeah. getting out no, of the honestly, yeah, don't, honestly, don't give us the Jermaine Jones politician answer. But but weirdly, if you look at the if you look at just some of the themes right now, it feels a lot like we're playing this whole youngest team at the World Cup. It's the youngest team at the World Cup. And like at least we've got now all we've got this, like now we're bumper bowling, right? So now no matter where that ball goes, it's look, going look, down look, to the pitch. trying to set this up, yeah. Jimmy. Come on. I we, think we had this, this conversation. I think this team finals. needs to Stop. score goals. I think this team needs to get points. Like that, that for me is they need to be on the final day of this group stage going into an opportunity to make the knockout rounds. That to me is, is the first two games is what, what I'm judging going into that final day with an opportunity to go to the knockout rounds. So if they're on, it's at least, I mean, it could be a point. It could be, it could be, it could be, it could so be three point. points. Point is there, is there, no, no, but I, I'm saying they need to be in contention so that they go into that third day. They win, they're in, they draw, they're in. There's some circumstances. Wait, wait, I, easy way out. He is. He is. Well, no, I wanted to add though. Is there a certain style that you want to see us play? Because as I as I've no. told in the story before about Jurgen Klinsmann and, and questioning <laughs> no. him about a would you rather, <laughs> it too. doesn't matter for you no. how we play as no. long as we get out. points to get out. No, I do not. Going into this World Cup, I've watched every World Cup. I've enjoyed every World Cup because when the U.S. fights, that's all I care about. And yes, do I think we'll have moments to be able to play? Will I see some of our uh, spectacular talent come out in things? Yes. But did you not watch those last two games? I did watch them. Play a certain way? I'm trying to forget those. Baby out with the bathwater. Go in there, fight. (laughs) You're going to have a game plan. And and if the game presents you things, then you take those opportunities confidently. But I don't want it to be – I don't want there to be this paralysis through analysis where, you know, this happens like this sequential, like this or that, this or that, this and that type of thing. No. Get rid you of all wanna, of that. You go don't back play to Nations any, would League. You rather? No, go back to Nations League. Go back to Gold Cup. What won it? Set pieces, fight, desire, all those things. We're in a World Cup. We'll worry about the rest for the three years after that and how we're going to win 26. I agree with you on the point that we got to take what the game is giving us. It's always the key. If Japan's going to take away the, the mid block, you just play long, baby, and we'll turn them around and play from there. You have to recognize what's happening and be fluid with your decision making. We're going to continue to reemphasize that over and over because it's super important. Hopefully the guys are listening. I'm sure they love our podcast. Maybe they don't. I don't know. Charlie, what about you? What's What would be considered good for you out of this World Cup for the U.S.? Getting out of the group. That's it. I'm not I'm not lowering my expectations. This team should get out of the group. I don't I, care I like it. what these past friendlies look like. I don't care some of the, the downs that they've had. They need to get out of the group. That is that is the standard. That is the bar getting out of this group. And it's not the group of death. You should beat Wales and you should beat Iran. It's not going to be easy at all. And if you take four points, awesome. But yeah. you should get out of this group. I agree with you on that. I and mean, I think that is the standard and the expectations that we should have. My my hopes, I guess, still feel cautiously optimistic because we're gonna suffer. And I'm curious to see how we do with that suffering. Every team suffers, even the What's ones that are gonna team? end up winning. Well, no, getting out of the group. I, I agree with both of you. I I would add in an element of I guess in terms of what we saw from mm, Japan. Ricardo Pepe scored. Game. Let's go. We're going to win the World Cup. Let's go. I'm telling you, Ricardo Pepe, every time he plays he's a game, on, he's, there, on he's, a he's on a tear. He's on a goal. tear. <laughs> I, absolute I, tear. I said he's going to the World Cup. I yeah. said it. I know it. And I feel that if he keeps going, he. Well, that's why goes. we're going to get out of the group. That's why number nine mm-hmm. scoring first for us, everybody. But there is an element of this this evolution. Like, it in doesn't theory, matter if it was a pen. It's a goal. In it's a theory, goal. in theory, the generation that was before us, and I know that you guys think I was part of five consecutive generations, and I, I appreciate that. But but they should be stepping on the shoulders of the previous generation. And, and you want to see that that growth, that we're getting better. And we are. We're obviously producing better players, playing with better teams that are consistently performing at high levels. But now that's all got to come together here. And if they don't have the elements that actually made our country special, which is that fight um, in, in, in particular, 
then that's going to be disappointing if we kind of fall into, well, we're so talented, we don't have to have the fight, which is we saw a little bit of that. So if they can get back to what makes our country special and add in the talent that they have, I think we we should have the expectations that Charlie have to get out of the group. And I'm curious because we don't know for sure. We're going to have to look back in 10, 5, 10 years and, and see. But this, this experience that they're going to get in 2022, everybody knows that this is going to be valuable experience for them to have tremendous success in 2026, where my expectations are going to be off the goddamn charts for us to do well, especially at home. Quarterfinal, semifinal, minimum. I'll throw it out there right now. But they need that experience from this to help them build for that. So so all of it's going to be a positive. If we can find that, I'm trying to build silver linings if we struggle. But mm. but uh, that's kind of where I stand. And that's that's uh, that's what I got. Also, there's another question, and I'll finish it up. And if you guys want to chime in, you can. Should Greg Berhalter still be the manager after this? I said it before. I say it again. I don't think any coach should have the national team for more than one World Cup cycle. I think the players need to hear a different voice and have a different type of juice uh, in, inside the culture, and, and everything needs to keep going. Even though I was the beneficiary of Bruce Arena's second cycle, I, I, I still think that the team needs to hear a different voice because I think some of those players that had been around Bruce maybe didn't respond to him in the same way as they did in the previous iteration. I don't know if you guys want to jump in on that. No, I just think that it's the it's whoever it is, and these they need to progress it forward, not come in and blow the exactly. Whole thing up I agree. Them. I agree with that too. Uh, but I, I do I, agree, I, a change is good. And and also, do you think it should be foreign? There's been some shouts that we need like a big time, big name foreigner to to lead us, Charlie. And mm -hmm. I actually don't necessarily think that's the case. I, but to to his point, you want to see that next step in our development. Yeah, Coach Chuck Wagon, 2026. <laughs> uh, what I, I will say is, I love is it. whoever makes sense whoever's a good fit if roberto martinez came became free after this world cup and had just helped develop belgium and turn them into a powerhouse and had guided their golden generation and was interested in being the u.s men's national team manager then yes that makes sense that's a foreigner but that's one who has had experience developing a culture uh, within right, a group right. and, and making the best or getting the best out of everyone so it just depends on who's available and and what's their interest level yeah, it's interesting. What's, you know, so I think that that's probably what I would go into it, not with a pre preconceived notion of it has to be American or right. it has to be foreigner. No, that's a good shout. I like that. All right, we're done. Mailbag right. is over. Podcast is over. And Soccer We Trust everybody. is over for this week. We will see you on Monday. And we're going to get into everything that happened for our player pool this past weekend in their club teams and any other big news. There's always some big news to discuss as always. So we'll see you then. On behalf of Producer Des, Producer Alex, Charlie Chuck, Wagon Davis, Hollywood Pierce, I'm Jimmy Conradino Conrad saying thank you for listening and watching In Soccer We Trust as always. And we'll see you soon. Later.